Once again, let's take a look at one of the films by Naoko Ogigami, director of Rent-A-Cat, Toilet, and Kamome Diner. This time around, we're jumping a decade after the earliest of these projects, and a half decade after the most recent, all the way to 2017. Today, we'll be looking at Close Knit, another narrative about family and organic human connection. We're not traveling to Canada nor Finland, though. Instead, in Close Knit, Ogigami brings us back to Japan in a niche part of society which doesn't often get attention in popular film. Namely, Close Knit deals primarily with the issues of adoption and existing as a transgender person in the modern world. Firstly, the film deals with what the Japanese family means to Okigami at this point in history. This is not the archetypical, squeaky clean example one would expect from some of Japan's post-war cinema. We don't observe a father, mother, son, and daughter as we examine their interactions in their respective gender roles as the forces of modern society force the characters to realign their priorities. Instead, we're here dealing with a young girl who is adopted by her uncle after being neglected by her own mother. Matters are complicated by the inclusion of the uncle's girlfriend and the introduction of her parents, as well as the young girl's own mother. Similar to some of the protagonists of Hirokazu Koreeda, like those in Nobody Knows or Our Little Sister, or the girl from Bunny Drop, we primarily follow a young woman, Tomo. Tomo is, in short, a neglected 11-year-old. As we're shown from the get-go, Tomo's mother regularly leaves her for extended periods, dropping a wad of cash on the kitchen table with a meaningless note. We join Tomo in the film with one such moment. In the opening scenes, after her mother disappears once again, Tomo takes this money and goes to buy sweets and manga, where she runs into her uncle, Makio, who works at a local bookstore. Makio takes her in, due to his pity for and a sense of obligation toward this young woman. In Makio's estimation, his sister is neglecting Tomo, and Makio feels the need to shelter her. Makio is used to his sister doing this sort of thing, but we get the sense that this occurrence is one too many, and that he has finally decided to do something about it. The night that Tomo comes around to buy sweets and manga, Makio asks her to come home with him. At least in that case, Tomo won't be alone. She won't be eating sugary snacks. She'll still go to school, and she'll continue to live in spite of her mother's faults. When Tomo and Makio make it home that night, the young girl is introduced to Makio's girlfriend, Rinko. As it turns out, Rinko is a trans woman who works as a nurse in an old folks home. Tomo is taken aback by her presence at first, but, of course, this is the point of the movie, getting over these predispositions and preconceptions in learning to treat people like, well, people, despite our own hangups. Rinko and Makio met at the old folks' home where she works, with Rinko taking care of Makio's mother, or Tomo's grandmother. Over the course of the film, we travel through Rinko's past as characters come to know her, in the present, meanwhile, we see that Tomo comes to look up to Rinko more than her biological mother. This makes sense, as Rinko shows Tomo nothing but love and acceptance, no matter what Tomo might think of Rinko initially. On the other end of the spectrum, her mother is almost not a character in the film, only existing in the narrative to appear at certain moments to react. Rinko helps create a world which Tomo inhabits, while Tomo's mother merely exists within it. With Tomo, Makio, and Rinko, we observe how these three form a family unit that grows strong by the film's conclusion. This connection is genuine and supersedes what little connection Tomo has with her biological mother. Why does this change happen so dramatically? The answer is simple, actually. It's one of Naoko Ogigami's favorite motifs, which helps explain deep human connection. Tomo and Rinko bond over food. In this case, the food is used to both strengthen their bond and to detail Tomo's childhood. Rinko and Makio initiate this connection by asking what type of food Tomo enjoys, and offering to make it for her so that she won't subsist only on sweets. As it turns out, everything Tomo asks for is bar food. Tomo is now old enough to stay home alone. However, given the relationship of Tomo's mother with random men, we can conclude that when she was younger, Tomo likely joined her mother on these nightly conquests. In this way, she came to associate this bar food with not only her mother, but also with the comfort that food can provide in times of struggle or uncomfortability. Rinko, on the other hand, laughs at Tomo's request, and offers to make her a proper bento. Here, we see Rinko treating her like a child, 
yet with more respect than her mother can offer. From this point on, the two cohabit their wanted roles, that of a daughter and a mother, meaning that this family has more cohesion than Tomo's legal and biological family. Here, we see Naoko Ogigami deepening her usage of food for these types of genuine connections. This, of course, is not the only way in which the trio bond as a family. There's also the inclusion of knitting, as well as the methods in which Rinko uses to communicate with Tomo. In the later example here, we're referring to further instances of how Rinko understands how to deal with children, while Tomo's mother does not. When Tomo is upset at one point, rather than Rinko bullying her and forcing the girl to speak with her on Rinko's time, the older woman offers her a makeshift telephone so that Tomo can feel comfortable and safe. This way, Tomo can communicate on her own terms. In other words, on equal ground with the adults of the film. Thus, where her mother offers neglect and derision, Rinko offers Tomo a true chance to grow and mature, quite contrary to what Rinko's detractors would have you think. Knitting, as we mentioned, is an equally important inclusion, and is notable as one of the film's most prominent symbols. Rinko initiates the act of knitting as an homage to her lost masculinity present in her transition. She's memorializing her childhood, more or less, drawing a nice bow of a conclusion on it so that Rinko can move on and get rid of that part of her life. Once Tomo moves in, the two bond over this activity. Rinko has been using knitting as an activity which helps hold her life and her identity together, and by passing this skill on to Tomo, the young girl is learning how to take stock of her own life. Both have been through some tough times, and while they bond over these difficulties, they're more importantly bonding over the healing process. Close Knit explores this family unit from multiple angles, both from inside the group and from outside. We primarily explore Rinko's childhood and young adulthood thanks to the proxy of her parents, people outside the group who retain these memories. When Makio, Tomo, and we as an audience meet Rinko, her transition has reached a point where we see her for who she is. Yet all of us lack the perspective of what she has gone through up to this point. Instead, we're relying on the reactions of other characters in the film, as well as our own preconception about trans issues, to inform how we view Rinko. When her parents show up halfway through the film, on the other hand, this understanding is assisted. Here, we meet a hyperactive mother and an absent-minded father, two individuals who seem remarkably eccentric compared with their daughter. As we see in this introduction, Rinko's mother is extremely protective of her, both as a child and an adult. In the present, we see her mother jumping down anyone's throat who may be harmful to Rinko. Rinko's mother is the mother Tomo wanted and needed, which explains why Rinko is in turn so kind to Tomo. Delving into Rinko's past, her mother speaks about the first moment when Rinko, then known as Rintaro, came out to her mother. In grade school, she stated that she wanted boobs, bordering on a breakdown for fear of judgment. Meanwhile, her mother said, of course, after all you're a girl, there's nothing wrong with you. As it turns out, this episode was inspired by a story Ogigami read in a newspaper. In this story, a young woman who was transitioning was helped by her mother, who made her fake breasts to assist with feeling more in line with the world and her true self. In fact, Ogigami has stated in interviews that coming across this story was the inspiration for the film as a whole, meaning that this flashback scene with Rinko and her mother is somewhat foundational for the film as much as it is for their relationship. Jumping back to the present, we see that Rinko is a well-adjusted adult in spite of her troubled upbringing, but likely thanks to the immense support from her parents. We see this most clearly when conflict is presented in the form of other adults, who are overtly rude to Rinko and her family. At one point, Rinko and Tomo are out at a grocery store when they run into a classmate of Tomo's. The boy's mother seems exasperated and claims concern for Tomo's well-being. She goes so far as to attempt to remove Tomo from Rinko's care on the spot. This is presented as bigotry plain and simple. Yet the important aspect here is the difference in reaction between Tomo and Rinko. Rinko tries to defuse the situation, suffering the abuses of this woman she has never met. Tomo, meanwhile, resorts to violence, which ends up landing the whole group in trouble. 
Whether this is meant to showcase Tomo reenacting violence she has seen in her neglectful household in the past, or if it's simply meant to be an expression of her personal rage at someone trying to take away her adoptive mother, one thing is clear. Tomo is still a child, and has not yet learned the coping skills Rinko uses to deal with a world which refuses to understand. In other words, Rinko represents the goal here in terms of maturity, while Tomo is shown as the immature child lacking in experience. She doesn't know how to handle this type of bigotry, and is thus as reactive as the bigoted mother herself. Rinko, of course, is not merely a product of her own maturity. She's also a product of something which Tomo has lacked for most of her life genuine human love. As Makio explains at one point, he was a bit confused when, in his words, he learned that Rinko used to be a man. Yet, it didn't matter, as he had already fallen in love with her. It only makes sense that the Rinko of the present is able to suffer these abuses so calmly and simply move on. She has a loving network of her mother, her father, and her boyfriend. It doesn't make the abuse okay, but it helps her weather it. Tomo has only recently begun to establish a network like this, and is thus not yet equipped to handle the world. Yet the juxtaposition of their reactions shows that one day, Tomo may aspire to be like Rinko in this regard. A twist of irony is added to the mix when we delve deeper into the life of this male classmate whose mother is bigoted against Rinko. As we see through his interactions with Tomo and other classmates, he's given just as much flack as Rinko, though for another reason. Given their age, you might understand that he and all the other kids are entering puberty and becoming sexually aware. Let's just say that this young man isn't exactly into what all the other kids are into, and the other kids are well aware, or at least they have their suspicions. After seeing his mother as well, we can understand that this kid has it rough, perhaps rougher than Rinko, given that she at least had her parents at that age. Due to the intolerant household in which he is being raised, he can't even complain about the kids at school, nor seek help for the bullying. The very mother who claims that her family is completely quote-unquote normal, in fact has a single child who sits right in the group against which she is bigoted. Given that this boy is in the closet and likely won't reveal this to his mother anytime soon, we're left to ponder how the paths of these two children will diverge. Tomo with her new family, which would be considered unconventional by the boy's mother, and the boy whose own family doesn't know his true self. In presenting this duality, we're shown two sides of the coin here. As far as we are concerned, Rinko's family is fully accepting of her identity, leading her to maintain a happy, productive life. She has a good job, a successful relationship, and the opportunity to raise a child, all the hallmarks of what would typically be considered a successful adulthood. Her mother was supportive from a young age, and her father accepting, though he doesn't speak up as much as her mother. The boy at school, meanwhile, is implied to be growing up under much more duress. We can't say for sure what will happen with his life, but for this story, that's not the important part. Instead, we're looking at the outcome of positive upbringing, while being questioned about the flaws of modern parenting and worldviews in the case of the boy. This film is primarily about Tomo, with Rinko and this boy acting more like bookends. Rinko is definitely an important character, but her story is more or less done. Her arc in the film revolves around knitting 108 phalluses to burn as an effigy to her lost masculinity. Otherwise, she doesn't undergo much development. She has already achieved the life she wants. The boy, meanwhile, still has his journey to travel, with no one being certain where that might lead him. Tomo, in the middle, can observe the beginning and end of just such a journey. She herself may not be a member of the LGBT community, as with the other two, but she can see the struggles and the humanity of these two individuals, as well as their respective support networks, and learn about herself, life at large, what she wants out of it, and most importantly, how to treat others who she doesn't understand. All of these complex yarns knitted together form the narrative and its world, leading us to question our own morality on all of these issues as well. Close Knit is a heartfelt film, and an important method of representation for a group not often seen in popular Japanese cinema. It also acts as a deep thought experiment for its audience that's more relevant today than any other time in modern history. Give this one a look if you haven't already. Unfortunately, the film has yet to receive an official release in America or the UK, but the Hong Kong company Panorama has released the film on Blu-ray and DVD, with English subtitles for your viewing convenience. 
Hopefully, the film will see a more accessible release this side of the Pacific. But until then, give it a look and let us know what you think in the comments below.